Welcome to The Rational Egoist. For those of you who don't know, I've been on a show called The Reality Show pretty much every week over the last, I don't know, month, month and a half. And that is a production of the Ayn Rand Center, United Kingdom. And the guy who started the Ayn Rand Center, United Kingdom is Rozzy Ginsburg. And he is here today as our guest to tell us all about it. Rozzy, welcome to the show. Thanks, Michael. Thanks for having me on. By the way, I think the reality show is, uh, it's just over three months and I think you've been there from the start, right? So uh... maybe, maybe it might be longer than a month and a half. My sense of time is a little bit shot. <laughs> you have to forgive me. Yeah, okay. I mean, mine as well. It was, a, it was a big project. So I'm glad it's, uh, you know, it's working out so far and I'm glad you're uh, a part of it. Oh, I, I, it's great. It's It's an absolute pleasure. So, well, you grew up in Israel, Razi, right? Well, yeah. What What was that like? And how old were you when you left? Uh, I left when I was 25. I, um, I, uh, for a few years as a kid and then as a teenager, I uh, left for like a year uh, with my, my parents. Um, so I lived for a year, a couple of years as a kid in uh, on the East Coast in the U.S., uh, a year as a teenager on the West Coast uh with my my mom and my stepdad and uh, uh I lived with my dad for a little bit in England uh and uh yeah so I I didn't live in Israel the whole time but uh most most of my uh early years were in Israel and what was the experience I mean did you grow up did you see war was that were you just in, enmeshed in that I mean hearing sirens and all that I somehow didn't experience uh pretty much any of that um really I mean, I lived in Israel at a time when there was uh, there were terrorist attacks. I personally wasn't uh, wasn't around any of them. Uh, there were no sirens. Oddly enough, I, I was told yesterday that the town where I uh, or the city where I lived for most of my life is um, uh, the number two most uh, targeted in the current war by uh, Hamas rockets. Uh, and um but yeah, it it somehow somehow it always escaped me. I mean, there was there was a a rocket that fell there um, uh, after last time I was there in May, like a couple of days later, somebody was killed uh, from a rocket there. Somehow, it, you know, I I've never been directly uh, affected, although I you know know people who have. So Israel's a, a fairly modern country, right? I mean, it's comparable to the united states in many ways yeah so would you say that your teenage years was it like if you were a teenager in america i mean you're going to parties and you know drinking or whatever in that sense yes yeah uh i still think the u.s is the you know more advanced in in many ways and uh better in almost every way so uh when i lived in the u.s uh, uh when i was 15 16 i um i i didn't really know to fully appreciate it but i knew i should appreciate it more uh more than life in israel so um uh but yeah you you do live a, a pretty much western life if you're growing up in israel in a not a religious community so when did you first come across the writings of ayn rand uh so i first read uh, uh book by Rand, a collection of essays when I was 19. I I, um, I was a leftist teenager. I uh, kind of transitioned away from the left in, in the context of Israeli politics. So transitioned away from the side that uh, uh, it would define itself back then as the, the side that is for peace uh, into the side that is um, questioning whether peace is possible and, and uh, the issue the issue that for me kind of uh, made me leave the left was the issue of settlements. Uh, oddly enough, I wasn't a settler. Uh, I wasn't, you know, particular fan of the settlers. But it didn't make sense to me that this idea that uh, for peace to happen, this future Palestinian state can have no Jews living in in that uh, state if the state is going to have peace with the Jewish state, where of course Arabs will live. Um, so that was my first move to uh from the left to the what was the israeli right 
Um, I followed U.S. politics a bit. There was the election of 2000, uh, Al Gore and uh, George W. Bush. That didn't really make sense to me as uh, as two alternatives. I found uh, the Libertarian Party uh, and uh, looked into libertarianism. It made more sense to me than anything else at the time. And I kept seeing Rand's name pop up everywhere. And um, I wasn't a fiction reader, so I didn't read uh, I, I heard she wrote two massive novels. I uh, wasn't interested in reading fiction that, as I understood, would confirm what I already agree with. And uh, yeah, what finally got me to read her was I saw a nonfiction uh, collection of essays titled Return of the Primitive. And uh, yeah, from there on out, the, the, in the next couple of years, I read everything she wrote, including the fiction pretty early on. And what was the attraction? Uh, that's a good question. I mean, I, I, and I'm trying to think of an answer, uh, that is unique because the first answer that comes to mind is I think something that many people say, but it's, it's, uh, probably the most accurate one, which is, you know, it all made sense, uh, pretty much immediately. It, it made sense. You know, I, uh, defined myself as an individualist before reading Rand and Rand kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, Put, or I wouldn't say I defined myself, I called myself an individualist and Rand gave me a definition uh, for that, for, uh, you know, just generally helped me um, uh, kind of have more clarity about things. And and uh, I'll, I have to say, I think when I look back, uh, my first few years after reading Rand, I, you know, would call myself a student of objectivism. But uh, yeah, until I started lis listening to um peak off courses, uh, I, I don't think I uh, had a, a fully, uh, you know, functioning grasp as in uh, knew how to live the philosophy. So. What, uh, what has been the biggest impact that objectivism has had on your life personally? Um, biggest impact. I mean, I, I it's, uh, I'm I'm trying to like take apart the the different elements of it, but I think that the the impact is uh it it has uh defined the way I think and the way I live. So it's uh, its impact is kind of you know uh, all uh, encompassing. It basically uh it is uh it is how I attempt to the best of my understanding and ability to live, and. Um, yeah, it uh, made me a happy person, which I don't think I uh, I was before. Although teenagers, you know, if I found Rand early on, I don't know many teenagers who are happy people. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, I also I do know many adults who are not. So um, yeah, it helped in that. See, for me, I think the biggest impact or the biggest draw is the the commitment to reason. It just that kind of sets the tone for everything else. But I did have a friend of mine that years ago, and I let him read Objectivism, the Philosophy of Ayn Rand by Leonard Peikoff. And I approached him, and he's a smart guy. And I said, Listen, I'm reading this book. You know, I've read this book a few times actually, and I really can't find flaws in it. And I said, Maybe I'm missing something. So I asked him, I said, Could you read the book? And then you come back and tell me if you found any flaws. And then we can, you know, discuss and debate him. He said, sure. And he came back and he handed it to me and he said, this book is absolutely brilliant. And what he liked was exactly what you just said. It was the integration, the fact that it just encompassed so much. That it was so explanatory that it really, really caught his attention. He, he really liked it a lot. So I, I, I like that you said that. Yeah. Um, you know, when I first started reading Rand, somebody said to me, you know, it's very important that you find something you disagree with her on. And uh, at the time, it, it kind of struck me as a problematic statement. Uh, uh, later on, I was thinking about it. And, um, you know, I, I think that's that's a kind of a skepticism that's so widespread, uh, uh, you know, in, in the way people think. Um, instead of saying, you know, you need to actually figure out whether or not what she's saying is true and figure that out about everything she's saying she's saying and then if something is wrong then it's wrong rather than specifically look because that is the, that is basically the other side of the same coin of saying i'm going to agree with everything she said because because she said it uh so 
so yeah, uh, it, it, if you are actually looking uh, through Rand's philosophy or through OPAR and you try to find uh, something that is wrong with it, it's that's going to be a tough task. <laughs> There's a lot good with it, a lot right with it. Now, at some point you, well, let me back up a little bit. So you, you leave Israel and where did you move? Right to England? Yeah, I moved to 25? England. Um I, I moved to London. Uh, I moved out of London uh, for about a year and a bit. Uh, spent some time in the Netherlands, then uh, spent went back to Israel for a few months, and then came back to London and uh, uh, yeah, been here um, consecutively since twenty eleven, I believe. And, and at some point, you start up sort of a an organization at, at first, I guess, the, the Ayn Rand Center United Kingdom. What are the origins of, of the Ayn Rand Center United Kingdom? Um, so it wasn't my intention. It was, uh, you know, I was working as a translator um, and uh, I just met some people in events who were uh, interesting. Some of them had read some Rand, uh, some, uh, you know, were, were interested in uh, her ideas, but hadn't read much. And Originally, I said, you know, let's get together regularly and um, uh, read Introduction to Objectivist Epistemology and then, you know, get together to discuss it. Um, different uh, things happened from that idea to when we finally started doing uh, weekly discussion groups in London about Rand's works, um, which uh, were then done through the London Ayn Rand meetup, which already existed. We never got to do Introduction to Objectivist Epistemology, by the way, although we did do uh, individual chapters because uh, I I want to keep it, uh, I from the start, I wanted to, you know, uh, have it also uh, uh, something that's open to new people uh, and that attracts hopefully new people to uh, to those events and those discussions. So it was very important for me to have uh, to only do discussions about things that are available for free online uh, on ARI campus, if it's an essay uh, on um, YouTube, if it's a peak-off lecture. And uh, yeah, so some chapters of, uh, of ITOE are available. So we we did some of those. But yeah, that's how it started. We, uh, we, we were doing those. We've been doing those weekly since the summer of 2016 with a break when uh, it became illegal uh, in the UK uh, during lockdowns. Um, and, uh, yeah, I think, I think it was a few months later when, um, you know, people, people noticed that I was doing things and I was asked to help organize events for objectivist speakers who happened to be passing through London. Uh, at some point I, um, uh, Andrew Bernstein, uh, I, I met him in New York and he was, uh, he was moving the next day to, uh, Bulgaria for the semester or for the, for the academic year. Um, to teach there and I thought you know Bulgaria is close by it'd be interesting if we can bring him over we ended up having him over for a week uh, having seven events in seven days and as I was organizing that I thought you know this would be this was my full-time job I I would uh, enjoy it so uh, it, that kind of started uh, the ball rolling and uh, yeah yada 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 founded ARC UK what is the mission? What, what What is, other than making a living, I mean, obviously you have to make a living, but what are your goals for the ARC UK? What are you looking to accomplish? So ultimately, the way I think about it is I want people to read Rand and I want people to, uh, you know, if, if, if we get somebody to the point where they had never heard of Rand and they are reading her for the first time, uh, that is a success. Now, there's things beyond that where we can take it further. Most people who have read Rand are not objectivists. Uh, and, you know, we do different things that I think uh, certainly ARC UK has a membership program. I think that people uh, that, that things that come with that membership are for people who have already read Rand and uh, want to go deeper. But, uh, you know, you mentioned you're on the reality show. We have the Daily Objective. We have a YouTube channel with a tremendous amount of content, more content than any other objectivist organization, even though we've only been doing this for a few years. Um, and yeah, with, with that content, uh, I, you know, ideally every piece of content we put on YouTube is something that will get people, um, started on the journey. Uh, now it, it varies, but that, that is my ideal. So they get, get them started on that journey. Even if that journey 
is you know watching the whole video then saying you know what this is interesting enough i'm going to watch another one i'm going to subscribe i'm going to keep watching and at some point i'm going to see who this person who the channel is named after is and um, uh, the person who's also quoted often on the channel and yeah so ultimately i want people reading rand two things that i really like uh, uh, about your station and about the programming one is that it's not hyper intellectualized. It seems to be just like objectivism for everybody. You know what I mean? Like you're you're not getting into the conceptual common denominator. <laughs> you know what I mean? In, in measurement omission and things of that nature. It's like objectivism as it's applied to everyday events so that people can see what it is and what are its real life applications. I think that's wonderful. And two is you uh, allow for disagreement. So when you have the reality show, there might be six of us with, you know, two, three to four different opinions. And that's great. It's not like everybody has to, you know, there's, this is the position of the ARC UK and you're all going to toe the line because to, people can be objectivists and have a different point of view. It's a matter of sometimes interpretation. Maybe I'm missing something. Maybe I'm not. But through those discussions where people are disagreeing is you end up learning more and, and you might get to a, a truth that you weren't thinking of before because of the discussion. Was that your intent when you started it was to keep it more for your, your common person to draw them to objectivism and to allow for a freewheeling debate? Um. Yes, definitely on the first uh, the first part, because I and it's part of me recognizing the importance of intellectuals, you know, people who did have been studying for decades and studying with uh, in part with the intention of of teaching. So, uh, you know, if somebody comes to uh, ARC UK and has read Rand or is reading Rand and, you know, enjoys our uh, more in-depth stuff that we do for for members and tells me that they want to become an objectivist intellectual, uh, I'm not going to tell them that there is any way ARC UK can train them to do that. I will say, you should go to, D go to the Ayn Rand Institute, uh, go to Ayn Rand University, study from, uh, you know, from the, the people there who have really uh, been you know, perfecting their understanding and their application of the philosophy. Uh, in our case, that's, you know, uh, none of us are, are professional intellectuals in, in that uh, in that way. And um, but we have been studying objectivism to uh, various uh, extents and time periods. Uh, we do try to apply it to our own lives. We try to apply it to our understanding uh, of everything. And, yeah, I think in terms of getting new people in, I think that's uh, uh, that's something that could be uh, possibly an advantage, uh, but is definitely, I think, a, a worthwhile um, a worthwhile endeavor. Uh, now, the, the point about disagreement, uh, yeah, I think that's that's a part of it. You know, people uh, understand uh, the philosophy and apply it in, in um, different ways. I think there is, uh, you know, there's there, there are things that are if you told me, you know, I, I read Rand, and if you if you really uh, understood it, you'll see why, you know, applying objectivist ethics properly to politics means you have to be a socialist. I'll say, no, that's not. You know, that's, that is, <laughs> and you know, if somebody again, like this is a somebody like that, I'm sure can start their own YouTube channel and tell <laughs> us why that is the case. Or if somebody wanted to tell me why uh, they support Hamas, uh, you know, and they wanted to say it on the channel and said, let's debate it. I'll say, no, that's not, that's, that's not a point that I'm willing to, uh, to debate, but uh, yeah, uh, you know, we, we also talk about a very broad spectrum of uh, ideas and topics and uh, you know, it's not clear cut. So yeah. Uh, someone that the guy that actually introduced me to you, James Valiant, he's great because he can do both. He can be an intellectual, but on the same at, at the same time, he's so personable and he can talk in such a common sense way that it, it's just a he, a great uh, person to have that that's regularly on your network because i really think that he can attract people in and plus he doesn't get offended if you disagree with him i mean he and i disagree all the time it's it, it's great fun it, not that the topics aren't serious 
but I understand. I, I like him. He likes me. We're not going to hate each other because we disagree. And I think that, that that's a good thing. And ultimately, Ayn Rand and objectivism are, uh, it's a philosophy for everyday life. It doesn't have to be a great intellectual endeavor. It's about how we live every day. Now, there has to be intellectuals, don't get me wrong, it, but everybody doesn't have to be an expert on Ayn Rand in order to live the basics of her philosophy. Now, you mentioned that you've covered a wide range of, of topics. What has been your favorite topic to cover? Don't say Israel, because I'm going to get to Israel soon. Uh, if Israel's it, then give me the second favorite. I want to know what's been your favorite thing to cover on the network. I'm All right. When, when you, it's definitely not Israel. When we get to Israel, I'll I'll tell you why. Um, I don't know. I mean, there's a you know prior to uh, the uh, time when we're, we're, this is being recorded, the longest, uh, the the most uh, uh, shows I've done, like most days in a row that I was on the channel, I think it was three uh, in 2021 when uh, in European football as we call it or soccer as you call it there was uh, uh, about to be some sort of split where some of the more um uh wealthy and successful uh clubs or teams were going to start their own league and this was the top story in the news for days uh there were like everybody was involved the prime minister of the of the UK said um we will stop this by any means necessary uh, th this was a very controversial issue, uh, but actually it wasn't that controversial because everybody was against them. Like everybody, I saw a panel on television where there were five panelists and everybody was in agreement. It wasn't like the reality show. Everybody was talking about how horrible this idea is. And we did three episodes in a row on this because uh, I thought it's it's uh, it's a good example. You don't have to uh, be interested in soccer to be interested in that issue because uh, the language used around it was really Marxist language, uh, uh, you know, applied to how uh, the idea that, you know, football uh, clubs actually belong to the owners, the people who put in all the money, um, whereas uh, the, the argument was that football belongs to the fans. Uh, so I enjoyed that. I enjoyed talking about it, uh, you know, uh, for a few days in a row. Uh, that's the first thing that comes to mind. I mean, there are times when we talk about environmentalism or environmentalists where I'm really annoyed. Uh, there are other times when we, uh, you know, they're they're doing and saying things that are so ridiculous that it's kind of fun and funny and we make fun of them. Uh, I, I don't want that to be like a main thing of, you know, in, in uh, our uh, content offering, but I think it's sometimes necessary, you know, when they have uh, uh, I don't remember if you were on this episode, but we had this 15 ways to conserve water uh, in, in The Guardian. And uh, The Guardian is a British newspaper. And uh, uh, there were things there like how to take quicker showers, why you shouldn't <laughs> flush when you use the toilet. So, uh, yeah, it was, uh, you know, that that's that's kind of enjoyable to, to be on. But I don't think that's the... Uh, you know that's our main uh, kind of content. Uh, um, that that's not where that's not where our strengths lie. Now for Israel. So you've been doing on the Israel. Uh, I guess it's a war now with Hamas, and you've been covering it regularly since the beginning. So since October seventh, today is October thirtieth that that we're recording this. So I have two questions for you. One, I mean, I, I understand you're Israeli, but other than being Israeli, what is the importance that this holds for you? Or is it just because you're from Israel? Yeah, so I was saying with the football thing, you know, I was on three days in a row. Uh, now I've been on, um, of, of the past 24 days, there was one day that we didn't do a show, uh, including weekends. We've been on every single day. Today was uh, October 30th. 30th was the first daily objective episode that I wasn't on, but I was on the reality show. Um, I mean, the reason I am on all the time and I, you know, I prefer in my ideal best case scenario of how ARC UK would operate, you know, if we had a lot more money and uh, uh, could do a lot more things, I would be on very, very rarely. And uh, I would be more on the side of managing the business. Um, 
the Israel topic is uh, the reason I'm on is definitely uh, in large part because I'm from Israel. I can watch the news from Israel and uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's a topic that I'm already knowledgeable about just because I grew up in it. Uh, the reason we cover it on a channel that is Ayn Rand Center UK and is and most of our audience is in the US. And so, um, you know, why why Israel's war is because uh, I, I think it's it's everybody's war. It is a, a war that all of us should care about. It is a 9-11 moment, a 9-11 like moment, uh, but worse in the sense that it is, uh, you know, uh, it's it's. 22 years after 9-11. And so the fact that it happened and the, the way that we're reacting and the means we haven't learned the lesson from 9-11 and the and the response back then. So uh yeah, if uh if I was uh you know if, if Ayn Rand Center UK was around uh in 9-11 and YouTube was around and I was uh you know the age I am now and everything, uh, we we would be covering uh that war on a daily basis and nothing else uh, like we're doing now with Israel. So, yeah, I mean, I, I live in a city where tens of thousands of people uh, marched a couple days ago and whatever uh, media wants to describe these uh, rallies as they are pro Hamas rallies. I mean, this is a war between Israel and, and, and Hamas. They keep telling us it's, you know, Hamas doesn't represent the Palestinian people, uh, which of course I disagree with, but, Hamas is fighting this war. If you are out, uh, you know, protesting against Israel in this war, you are protesting on the side of uh, of Hamas. And so, yeah, I think it's uh, it's it's the war is here in our homes, in our in our uh, Western countries, and uh, you know, we'll. Uh, I hope I'm wrong, as I keep saying, but I think we are. Uh, you know, it's only a matter of time until we experience something similar. How do you think objectivism? helps to explain these type of events these to these type of uh, you know terrorist attacks where you have basically primitive c countries or primitive people attacking civilized people how how does objectivism help to explain that and how does objectivism apply to finding solutions um I think it helps explain it basically from the most basic level of uh, metaphysics and epistemology and how individuals uh, view themselves and view the world around them. And, uh, you know, we can see it, we can see in the West, for example, even uh, when people are religious, for the most part, they don't take religion uh, that seriously. They don't pray when something needs to get done. They actually get it done and then they'll pray when they have the time off on the weekend. Um you know, people, people, you know, for the most part, uh, understand that, uh, that they need to uh, adhere to reality, they need to uh, uh, be rational, uh, as, as much as they can in order to survive. I think uh, the more people take religion seriously, and the more faith people have, the more likely you are to see, uh, you know, what, what we see in the Middle East, because their religion is taken seriously. So, um, yeah, and and I think you know Rand has uh, uh, written and spoken about uh, all the branches of philosophy, how they connect to each other. She's also applied it specifically. I mean, one of one of the you know most uh, uh, relevant uh, moments was when she was asked um, during the hostage uh, crisis when the um, uh, U.S. Uh, embassy uh, people in the U.S. embassy in, in Iran were taken hostages. Uh, you know, she was asked how the U.S. should respond, like while this was happening, a few months into it, and she said something like, "I don't remember off the top of my head, but it's." It, she said something like, "It's too late now. We should have gone in on on the first day, uh, you know, with the full might of our military, and the fact that we haven't is going to be is something we're going to be paying." Uh, paying for for decades to come because we have shown weakness and uh and yeah we'll pay the price for it and we did you know uh iran uh you know is is um is is certainly in the middle east uh with israel's uh enemies is uh you know they're they're the ones behind everything 
Uh, they weren't directly behind 9-11, but the, the, the fact that we uh, allowed them to get away with uh, with what they got away with with the hostages um, and, uh, you know, the, the weakness that uh, the U.S. showed in the Middle East is something that uh, only emboldens, uh, you know, the worst elements. It doesn't, it, you know, nobody... Nobody who fights for if if there's anybody who's fighting for freedom and for reason in those countries, uh, they they are at a disadvantage once the country that is supposedly the biggest representative of, of reason and freedom, uh, you know, gives in to uh, to terrorists. Rand wrote an essay, right, called Faith in Force, the Destroyers of the Modern World. I think it was called, and that's just so applicable because it, that's what it is. And, and she talked about, I don't remember if it's in that essay, but that faith and force are corollaries, that one necessarily leads to the other. And, or, then, or rather, I think it's faith comes first and, and leads to force. I'm not positive. But it just seems so true and so applicable to these situations where in the Middle East, there's just constant war i mean people can try to blame israel all they want but even absent israel the, the arab countries and in, in the middle eastern countries go to war with each other and there's wars within them so it's not as if the di this dynamic of faith and force only comes into play because you have israel there right the, these the, the this combination of faith and force is toxic i, I guess it, it's extremely damaging like rand said yeah Arab countries uh, fight each other, uh, you know, Arabs fight each other or Muslims fight each other within their own uh, within their own communities. Uh, you know, these are not communities that uh, that operate rationally, uh, you know, or would operate rationally absent uh, the occupation or whatever it is we're uh, supposed to believe is the reason for them, uh, you know, behaving the way they do. Again, Hamas, uh, their regime in Gaza is a theocracy in effect uh it's not a, it's not a theocracy because of a blockade it's a theocracy because this is what they believe there's no blockade in iran or in saudi arabia but they are also theocracies and they're uh better functioning theocracies in the bad sense you know they, they can they can uh uh apply um you know their uh, religious political system uh much more freely uh than than uh, hamas can in gaza all right, my last question for you is, if you had one book, if somebody came to you and said, I want to learn uh, objectivism, what one book would you recommend to them? Um, the Fountainhead. I mean, look, I, I don't I don't think that's the book. Uh, that's the one book where you would learn objectivism the best. But I think that's the one book you should read. Um, you know, if you really uh want to understand the what i think is the uh you know the greatest achievement uh philosophically that uh that rand had i would say introduction to objectivist epistemology i was i was gonna say that and then i i thought no actually that is you know i have people uh coming to our uh our london ayn rand meetup which is weekly here in london who have never read rand or who only read the essay uh for that day and they asked me and uh um, yeah, I, I, I usually check with the individual. Are you more of a fiction reader? Because again, if, if you know, when I first heard about Rand, I heard about these massive novels, and that was not for me, and I wasn't going to read them. Uh, so, you know, if somebody is just going to start with, you know, uh, an essay, I would say read Philosophy Who Needs It. That's a good starting point. Uh, then maybe read the book Philosophy Who Needs It. Um, then uh, the Virtue of Selfishness. But, uh, but yeah. If if you want if you want the one book that's going to inspire you to read the other books, I think that's the Fountainhead. I think that's the it's, it's my favorite novel. I think it has the greatest hero in the sense of uh, if you want to um, look at somebody really as inspiration for how to think and go through life, including uh, including you know when it's not as easy as uh, you'd like it to be. Then uh, yeah, that's you mean that's you wouldn't just tell them to follow me on Facebook. Uh, I think that that comes naturally afterwards. <laughs> yeah, on fa speaking of Facebook, I, one time on Facebook, somebody asked that question: "What one book would you recommend?" And at first, I said "Object Introduction to Objectivist Epistemology" because my thinking was, "Well, that's where you learn how to reason, and if you learn how to reason, then you learn the rest better." But then somebody else said, "Philosophy: Who Needs It?" 
And I think now that's where I go. Now you're right. If somebody would rather read fiction, th that's a different story altogether. But if somebody just said to me, look, I, you know, what, what would you recommend? I, I'm interested in learning the basics of objectivism, maybe getting involved. I would tell them philosophy who needs it, but I don't really know that you could go wrong. I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't recommend, uh, objectivism the philosophy of Ayn Rand right off the bat and probably not objectivist epistemology that was probably a, a bit uh ambitious on my part but I think if you were to go with the virtue of selfishness or uh philosophy who needs it return to the primitive uh, or the, any of the novels I, I think you'd be you'd be fine they're they're all absolutely fantastic it does also very much depend on on the individual. Yeah. There are people who have a great interest in epistemology, and I think if they read, uh, you know, that 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 might get them to actually read it. Whereas with something else, you know, uh, like with me with the fiction, I had no intention of reading uh, Rand at all because it was it was uh, fiction. And then I I found the nonfiction, and I went quickly to the fiction in part because she quotes herself in the nonfiction, and I was worried about spoilers. But, uh, you know, I was I was uh, very happy that I went uh, to the fiction as quickly as I did. And it wouldn't have happened if I'd not started with a collection of essays. Well, Razi, thank you so much for being here. Where can people find you? I mean, I know there's a lot of places. Give them all. Uh, Ayn Rand Center UK on YouTube. That's the that's the main place uh, where I think people should go and people can find me, especially if you're watching this now while stuff in Israel is still going on. I uh, tweet about it a lot at Rosie Ginsburg on uh, X. I, I, I X about it. I don't know what the. <laughs> yeah, what do you do tweet. now? You don't tweet. Do you X? I don't, I don't, I don't know yeah. what the hell to call it. Well, but I you tweet do. on X. So, you, do, uh... you do tweet on X. I've, I've seen some of your tweets on X myself. Rosie, thanks again for being here. For now, this is the Rational Egoist signing out. I'm Michael Leibowitz. Till next time.